Hello folks, I'm JP. It's Tuesday, January 20th, 2015. Uh, it's after midnight, it's a little bit late, but I wanted to show, I wanted to make this little video and show you what all I've been working on recently. Um, one thing that I realized is that I should just uh, front load the good stuff, like the, specifically the visuals. So if I have something cool to show off visually, then I'll just put it right in the first couple of minutes here. Um, so yeah, this is uh, evidence proof if you will, of uh, character flipping and rotation working. Um, it, I had, it had always been in the plan for me to make it so that you could rotate characters um, or even flip them left to right, rotate them 90 degrees, 180 degrees, etc. And so this is just a modification of the older test art and animation thingy that just shows that that is now possible and it's getting saved in correctly into the place key files and all that stuff. So that's cool, um, but the other thing that you might notice here is that uh, we now have, I'll minimize the other stuff here so you can just clearly see, um, yeah, is that this this uh, application has a UI now. It's got a frame rate counter drawing with text in a different character set up in the corner there. Um, and down here it's got the beginning just like a temp for a status bar. Uh, but the cool thing that shows a lot of the work that I've been doing lately is this which is a quake style pull down console. You hit tilde and then this thing pops down, it slides down and fades in and it shows you the current running log and you can type commands into it. Um, and the kinds of commands that you can type into it, there's two kinds. Uh, you can type a command like open an existing file. Uh, and one of the things that I did here is you'll note that um, when I typed open, open is a command that it recognizes and can map to an internal console command, and it turns yellow to show that that is valid. Um, and then we hit this, and it opens up, the application opens up a second file. Uh, this is our owl that, from back in the Edsky days, I might have posted on Twitter at some point. Um, and so yeah, what we've got here is two different art files open, um, which is the beginning of, yeah, the you know, the, the application's multi-document interface support, and ultimately when this thing becomes, makes the leap to becoming a game engine, it just means that, you know, the object system will be like, oh yeah, there's all these different objects and they all have different art and renderables and stuff, and that's all, I can just deal with that just fine. Um, and yeah, like it, after we entered this command, it spat out a little bit more. Everything that gets logged to standard out now is also logged to this console and vice versa. Um, it's also saved out to a file called console.log, which would be useful for testing or something. Like if you're getting a weird crash, then maybe you can see something, you know, you can see what happened. So yeah, that's all pretty exciting and cool. Um, yeah, what else? Um, yeah, I think that's a lot of it. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of stuff, like just getting the UI drawing here, like obviously this is on its own layer. And you can kind of see maybe the video is high quality enough that you can see that uh, all of the UI stuff is being drawn with a little bit of uh, a grain texture, I call it, um, which is just to distinguish it from flat colors. Like if you have the CRT shader off and the UI uses the Commodore 64 palette just because I don't really see a compelling reason to not. Um, the, the, the UI font here is a one by two proportion font of my own creation from an old project back in the day. Um, so yeah, I guess I could uh, I could go into some of the code for this. Um, the uh, the support for flipping and rotating characters is uh, is kind of interesting. Um, like I knew when I made some of the older architectural decisions in this, uh, I knew that it would be relatively easy to support this because with one bit here, with one byte rather, with one integer, um, I can actually tell each tile. You know, in the let me jump into the the Edsky file here um, for our little yeah. So it is now inside of Petsky data art files. It now saves an X form integer as well as the background color, foreground color, and character. Um, and that integer corresponds with one of these preset UV things. Um, and I talked a little earlier about UVs, but um, I realized that it's actually like way more difficult to get your head around if you're not familiar with it. 
uh, if com than if you don't have a visual figure. Um, this is a this is a, an OpenGL tutorial uh, on DurianSoftware.com. This this guy did a really good OpenGL tutorial that uh, was useful to me when I was learning a couple of months ago. And he's got some really nice visual figures here. Like yeah, this is just actually just showing the vertex order for I don't know drawing triangle strips or something. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things like this, and this is showing, these are little diagrams showing how texture sampling works. And you can see these UV coordinates here that it's using to look up pixels in the texture. Um, and so you can see, like, you know, these UV numbers are always something like 0, 0, you know, they're normalized, so it's 0 to 1 the along the, the, oh, it's the T and S axis, actually. Yeah, I forget that that's the right terminology. So anyway, um, the normal UVs for a single quad, which is to say uh, a, a a rectangle made of two triangles um, is these numbers, which are just kind of inscrutable unless you've actually just kind of like, you know, drawn it out and figured it out for yourself. And then simply by changing what these numbers map to, you can get a rotated character. Um, so, and I knew that if I was storing UVs per tile, which I would, which I kind of needed to in order for, for my whole general approach to work, that I would be able to do this trivially just by, you know, looking this up. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a, you know, that, that was a, that was a cool under the hood thing. I also, um, I, I spent about a, you know, a, the better part of a day just, um, just rewriting a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the array access, uh, code. Actually, yeah, so... <laughs> Somebody, uh, folks have been commenting, folks who have watched these videos have commented on my pronunciation of, and see, now I'm self-conscious, so I don't know if I can, uh, I don't know if I can, uh, you know, if I can, if I can do it. I would pronounce it air ray? I think I would pronounce it air ray. Um, and the emphasis would be kind of on array. But apparently that's weird, you know, I, I had like both uh, British English speaker, speakers and American English speakers just kind of be like, man, you, you pronounce, a, you pronounce array, wait, array, okay, and so I think, I think the emphasis is like this, array, or I don't know, I, I don't know the notation for, you know, uh, I don't know the notation for, you know, the phonetic pronunciation thing. Um, anyway, arrays. I'll try saying it array like arrays now, and that, that already feels less weird to me. So anyway, um, I rewrote uh, how uh, I'm initializing NumPy arrays. And the real value of that is that I realized that before I was using... Um, I was using... Uh, let me uh, talk it out here. Um, I was using uh, so yeah, I was using uh, one-dimensional arrays here, and so if I had something that was like an eight by eight quad, it would be represented like this. It would just be a list, and then just a single-dimensional, you know, like a shopping list or something list of these. Um, and the thing that I didn't realize was that um, you can actually, like if I wanted a, if this was an 8x8 eight eight, um, piece of art or something, then actually I can give it uh, a tuple uh, which defines its shape. And that actually gives me a two-dimensional array. And that ends up being a lot easier to think about and address. Like before I was having, back when I had... Um, Back when I was doing these weird, um, yeah, okay, so I've got A and B here. When I was doing these, in order to get, like, I would be like, oh, yeah, what's, um, if I want to get, like, the fit, the third row of B here, I kind of have to do, like, you know, the row width times the, you know, the thing and all that, and then I would do B index. Whereas now, I can just say A What's the, you know, if I want the third column, well, sorry, the third row of the fourth column here in A, well, of course, it's going to be zero because, you know, this it was initialized to zero. So anyway, what, what that now means is that um, any of my, any of my uh, array access things here where it's like, give me the character index at this location, um, I can actually just say, 
you know, give me the frame, like this is coming from a Python list, and then the layer, like I'm actually using 3D arrays here, because layers, this actually makes a lot of sense, you know, when you think about how, um, yeah, like when we open this up here, yeah, see, so like this is a 3D array, because each layer is on its own, you know, so that's the topmost dimension of this array, and then the Y and then the X define, like, the, 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 the rows and columns, respectively. Um, so that ends up being a, a big win for uh, code simplicity, and also just in the future when I have to do weird stuff, when I have to just, like, access an array or write to an array in interesting ways. NumPy uh, has some features for, uh, for doing this, and uh, so when I want to, say, resize, I can actually, let's see, is that, uh, is that what I'm thinking of here? Yeah, um, NumPy has some built-in stuff for resizing these arrays. So when I'm doing something like, um, when I want, uh, like, if the user, like, pretty soon I'll have the, you know, the, 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 the art editing UI up and working here. So if the user's like, well, I want to crop this thing right here, you know, uh, let's, and in, in effect, let's, re let's resize that array. Um, that would have been somewhat difficult before because I would have been, like, kind of chopping arrays, chopping data out of this one-dimensional array. Um, that looks like, you know, that looks like this thing, I would have been like, okay, well, in order to remove a row, I've got to, like, take these out, and then I've got to take these out, and then I've got to kind of squish all that together, whereas now I can just use NumPy's resize thing, and it's smart enough to go like, okay, well, we're taking one row off here, and then we're taking one column off here, you know, because we're only reducing it by one. Um, and I ended up needing to do that for uh, UI for UI stuff. So that's the thing about UI, is that this is actually using this same uh, art, like th the UI stuff here, like this console here, is actually just a piece of art um, whose values are just getting poked, like, you know, with string stuff in real time by the UI class. Um, this is a, yeah, there's a base UI element class, and the other ones are pretty trivial, like the frames per second counter and the status bar, which is really just... Um, so yeah, you can see here that I'm like doing things that normally operate on art, like clear frame layer and then write string. Um, and that's really nice because, you know, under the hood, like there's not really a performance penalty for this, you know, unless you're writing to your UI constantly. Um, you know, and we're usually doing it, like, one at a time here, you know, and that's not, as you can see, the frame rate's doing fine. Um, so, yeah, like, that's pretty cool, and I just realized, you know, as I was getting the UI on its feet, I was like, how differently should UI work under the hood compared to a piece of art that the user actually edits? Uh, and the answer I came up with was not that much, and it's panned out pretty well so far. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going with that. Um, the console itself is, you know, it's a UI element which, you know, talks to the, which the UI talks to and says, hey, run your update, and hey, render. The UI element, in turn, has a piece of art. Every UI element, now let's go back to this, um, UI elements have pieces of art that kind of define the thing, and then they have a renderable. They usually only have one piece of art and one renderable, i.e. the sort of character Gr data grid, and then the renderable, which is the actual OpenGL object that kind of keeps track of all that, of, of the state that the renderer needs to care about. Um, and then, yeah, the console just does stuff that a console does. This is sort of like a, you know, I mean, it's a shell, right? Like, um, it, it, it's, it's able to, like, update its lines. It's like, okay, I have this many display lines, and here's how I populate that. This is, this code for, the code for making this thing you know, pan down and fade in and pan up and fade out. It is the it is by far the worst code I have written yet on this project. It's really just it's bad. It's skunky and weird and if you get a glance at it here you can probably see why. It's just it's just silly. Um but it works for now with no bugs or anything, so and I wanted to have it done for this demo. So yeah. Um, but yeah, the cooler stuff that it's doing is it's saying, like, uh, the main, the application's main input loop, um, whoops, lost my place, um, just passes, if the, if it, if it sees that the console is up, it just passes the input in, which is actually like a raw SDL key code, basically. 
Um, and then it turns that into a string and says, like, blah, if you're doing blah, some of these are special, like enter is obviously, like, run this command. Um, and then I've got some to-dos here. I want to have tab autocomplete and uh, page through command history with up, you know. Backspace obviously needs to work. That's a pretty standard feature. Um, and then it just gloms this on to a little string that the user is building, and you can go backspace and add to it more, and you can hit alt backspace, and it deletes the whole line and all that. Um, and then once you hit enter, it runs it through parse. And what it tries to do here, yeah, that's something that I didn't demo earlier, um, is that in addition to these commands, like you know, opening something, you could also just type a Python expression into this, um, you know, and it evaluates. Um, I think it gives an error if you just try to do something. It's actually, it's passing this to Python's eval function, which I believe evaluates and then returns the output of that. Like, and in this case, the print statement returns none, so it doesn't do, it returns none. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to figure out ways around this. I mean, like logging, just, just echoing to the console is obviously not very useful. Um, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I want to do here. Also, it's, it's doing, it's just saying error right now, you know? It's like, I don't recognize this. I tried to eval it and it just came back an error. I'm going to try to get the Python exception type, uh, because that's actually more useful for the user, you know, if you're typing away. Um, and then, yeah, I want to get, uh, yeah, so, and as you can see here, I can actually access the program state at runtime. I can say, like, uh, I can say, hey, what's this thing? And because I don't have page through command history, so I can actually get a real value out of this, see? Um, unfortunately, I do not think that I can... Um, I don't think I can do this. Yeah, see, like, I can't manipulate values directly. Um, I can I can echo them, and then it, you know, so this might be a limitation of, of using eval or something, um, but I'm going to figure out, because I do want you to be able to just, like, talk to the program like this. I might, like, give it, give you an easier namespace so that you can just say, like, you know, this is the main application object. It's already kind of shortcutted for you, and then we can just blah. Um... Anyway, so yeah, I think that's most of what I've got. Uh, what's next on the old roadmap? Um, yeah, I, I want to make the console. The reason that I did this console is because I think it's going to make several kinds of debugging easier. Uh, because normally, like if I want to log something, you know, in Python, Python has some good debugging tools, but uh, you know, a lot of times print out, print debugging is useful enough, and this is just a quicker way to that. You know, where I can say, like, hey, give me the value of this thing. I don't even have to, like, shut down the program and relaunch it. You know, um, I can, uh, I'm pretty sure if I type the right incantation here, I could actually modify some of the art on the screen here, which is wicked cool. Uh, and that's kind of, like, a stepping stone to getting actual UI working. Um, um so yeah, I, I want to make the console a little bit more usable, and then it will it will be good for a while actually, and then uh, and then I'll move on to yeah I want to get um, the uh, the status bar working. Right now this is just showing some some static text, and I want to get that showing some notion of a selected. Uh, let me go back to my character to my mockup thingy here. Um, let's see. Yeah, here we go. Um, this is the mock-up that I did shortly before I began all this UI work. Um, I want to show the selected character, the selected foreground color, the selected background color, the tool, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is probably what it's going to look like. These are two different incarnations of this pane, uh, this panel pop-up thingy. Um, so yeah, I want to make it look like that. Uh, and so yeah, the status bar, I think, is the next to getting that, because and then because then that brings a concept of a selected character col and, and colors. Um, and then I want to get the cursor working. The cur and by cursor, I mean um, I mean the thing that I had in, uh, in Ultima 4 map view where um, doo -doo. just this, um, this rectangular cursor thing here. Um, I think place keys will look a little bit snazzier, but I want to do the whole, like, yeah, you can cur put your mouse over something and edit it. Because really, you know, this is a paint program, and it needs to be, 
you know, it needs to be able, it needs to have mouse support, obviously. Um, I think I'm probably also going to, to have some sort of, uh, I'm just going to open up this piece of art because it actually looks nice. Um, you know, uh, I think I might also support the arrow keys, um, moving the cursor around. So you might, you could hit right arrow key if the cursor was here and it would go doot, 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 doot. Um, cause being able to edit purely by keyboard is kind of nice. And sometimes you just want to nudge the cursor over one, you know, so I think it'll support mouse and keyboard flows pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well. Um, and then once I've got the cursor working, uh, I can start implementing, uh, this, the, the, the pane that pops up when you hit space bar and you can select, and that's actually, that's probably going to be a fair amount of work because it's like, uh, you know, I, I want to like build in at least stub concepts for these tools that, you know, you can use to manipulate things. And then, yeah, like the character and color picker, uh, and that's, that'll be super cool. And then at that point, it'll basically be usable. Like you'll you'll be able to actually create art and save it and all that kind of stuff, so that's super exciting to me. Like you know, I'm getting like it's starting to get within sight of this thing actually being an art tool. I have no idea how long that's really going to take me to get to that point where I can just click on the screen and it paints a character down or a color down. Um, it could be by the end of this month, but I don't know. You know, I mean, the rate of progress is kind of nonlinear and stuff. Uh, I would love to you know, just cap January off by doing that. I guess we're two thirds of the way through it now. Um, but yeah, who knows, you know, maybe I'll get, uh, maybe I'll get derailed on something. Maybe I'll get stuck on something for a few days. Who knows, but I'm optimistic and I hope you've enjoyed this look at the latest progress on it. And, uh, as always, thank you so much, Patreon supporters. And thank you just anybody who's watching this for having a look and yeah, I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Good night.